last lecture uh, of today's session. Uh, we welcome back again Daniel Fisher, uh, who will uh, uh, lecture on uh, ecology and evolution in high dimensions. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. So again, please um, put questions in the chat and I will try to keep an eye on them. And as Antonio will prompt me if I haven't seen, uh, um, uh, haven't seen one of them. Um, so um, yesterday we talked about some um, and assembled communities, which a lot of speakers have talked about, and particularly talked about the effects of having many islands with migration um, uh, between them and what the effects of that are. So what I'm going to talk about first today is how one gets to some of the results that I talked about, the dynamical mean field theory. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go to that in, in huge detail. It's, it's quite technical and difficult to actually solve the, the dynamical mean field equations. So I will give what they are and sort of motivate it and then sort of give some heuristics about those. But if you're interested in that in, in detail, it's in this paper in um, uh, PNAS from Michael Pierce and Atish Agarwala, who'll be involved in all of this, uh, um, um, all of this work. The, um, some of the recent things that I'm going to... Um, uh, mention or come towards, I won't really get to his current work, which is also involves Aditya and Maharavan, who were, if we were all in Trieste together, you would uh, um, meet since he's at the, at the workshop um, at the school. Okay, so after talking about um, that, I'll then talk about some of the robustness of this uh, phase that comes that I showed last time, this spatiotemporally chaotic, um, uh, chaotic phase. And then I'll turn to things that are really um, uh, open and, and ongoing, um, asking about the question of whether communities like this can evolve or how they evolve in the future, and then make some brief comments about phenotype um, um, uh, models um, and where particularly in the focus in the context of bacteria and phage um, um, and phage interactions. Okay. So just uh, um, first remind of what the um, um, of what the model is. So we have K strains, K closely related strains labeled I equals one to K. These all exist on I islands alpha equals one to the total number of islands. The islands are all identical. Um, the populations of on island I, sorry, on island alpha of strain I is N and the total per island N alpha is, is equal to big N, which is roughly a, uh, um, uh, a constant kept by the overall limits on resources. The frequencies which we'll use or the fractional abundances are the new I alphas, which are just the ratio of the on that island to N. So those are the basic dynamical variables that we'll uh, um, work with. Okay, then there is a small migration rate between islands. It's small compared to the typical growth rates on the islands, which are of order one or actually of order one over root K, but um, um, uh, the M is small compared to, uh, um, uh, to, compared to those. Um, and that's actually, it's important to be relatively small for the, um, uh, for the behavior of this phase. Okay. Then there um, can be some selective differences between the types. They just overall grow faster than others or slower than others, the SI, and that's going to have some variance sigma S squared. And mostly I'm going to ignore this, but I'm going to come back and say some things about it towards the end. Okay. The interactions, they're only within the islands. They don't depend on the islands. So there's matrix VIJ. We also can have an interaction of a type um, with itself, a strain with itself, which is much stronger potentially with a, um, which would be then minus the Q. But since we're interested in closely related strains where there's no particular reason for that to be stronger, we're gonna mostly set this to be equal to uh, um, zero. Okay. Well, then a crucial parts with the Vs, instead the Vs are random. So I have to tell you the um, statistics of the Vs. So the average of the Vs is uh, um, zero as is the average of the Ss. And then the, um, the variance to be one. And this just sets the, uh, um, uh, sets the time scale um, uh, here. So this basically just gives you the time um, scale. Okay, but then, and then the Vs are independent except for correlations across the, um, across the diagonal. So a particular correlation of the effect of what J does to I with the effect of what I does to J. And that has this parameter gamma. And we're gonna particularly focus on gamma negative, which is sort of motivated by, particularly by the predator to prey um, um, uh, uh, context. But I'll say something about um, things being more general. So we're looking at these anti-symmetric correlations, then gamma in this, uh, um, um, in this range. And the canonical value for the stimulations and things is gamma of minus 0.8, um, or a good value. Okay. So what is the basic, uh, um, um, the basic dynamics then? So here's my dynamics. So there's the overall growth rate. That'll depend on growth minus death. That'll depend on the selective differences. It'll be a niche interaction if we include it, but we're mostly not, I think we mostly ignore that. And then there's the interaction with all the others on the same, uh, um, um, on the same island. Um, and then there is this piece, 
which is the Lagrange multiplier, whose role is to keep the total n on that island being uh, um, being fixed at um, n. So that acts on each island separately, and it's going to be in you know transient things at least is going to be dependent on time. Okay. And then there is the part from the migration. And the crucial feature in the migration <clears throat> is that the migration comes from all islands to all other islands. So the total migration in them will come from all of the other islands, be the sum over the same strain on all of the other um, islands, which is basically going to be the island average and the limit that i is very um, large. Okay. We're going to take entirely deterministic equations with no stochasticity. There is a possibility of local extinctions. We'll sort of add that uh, in if the news, since they're the fraction of the population, become less than one over n. So this is less than one um, individual, but they can get repopulated by migration from the um, uh, from the others. And so we can understand the effects of this, but we're initially not going to include that and take n to infinity. Okay. So I showed last time from um, uh, simulations that what this system um, goes into is it goes into a spatiotemporally chaotic phase. Some fraction of the, uh, um, all the strains go globally extinct. It turns out to be a small fraction. Um, usually a small fraction depends on parameters. Um, they, they go globally extinct, but the surviving ones that persist, they form a, they go into a chaotic steady state after some initial transients. And the crucial part of that chaos is it's deschinkernized across the islands. And the reason is if you have chaotic dynamics on two islands, there's a positive reappen of exponent and the coupling between them from the migration is relatively small, then they, um, um, you will, they will tend to uh, um, uh, uh, desynchronize. And that happens all except if the, mi the migration is quite large. Okay. So we've got this, this phase, and I'll just show the one of the figures that showed from last, uh, um, um, from last time. So this is one type, one strain across 10 of the uh, um, islands. And this is plotting on a log scale. And that's because the natural bouncing around is on the log scale because the growth rates um, and death rates uh, um, vary. So this is bouncing around. They can bloom up to high abundances here. So they all have these, uh, um, um, each of them has a bloom. Um, they all bloom up to high abundance, but then mostly go down and sort of hang out down near, um, down near here. Now what stops them going too low? Well, is the input here from the migration is it called the migration floor, which is this curve here. It's bouncing around because that's an average over all the islands. And this is this new bar coming in. So that stops them going too, uh, um, too low. Okay. They can go extinct, but I've put the extinction threshold down here. So that's the condition that the population migration is big enough, the product of those. So that's the extinction threshold they can go, they can go below. And you notice here actually um, the, the global population goes below that, but some of them are surviving and they uh, um, uh, repopulate this island that actually went, um, um, where it went extinct there locally. Okay, so the crucial part here, as far as the, the, you know, the qualitative features, is that the fluctuations on each island are on a log scale. They're fluctuating over the log scale, uh, um, um, log scale here, and that log scale is set by the size, of the, um, um, the size of the migration. So the range this goes over here, these fluctuations, is a range of log one over m will basically be the, uh, um, the range of the fluctuation. So if M is small, they can go over a big, uh, um, a big range. Okay. Um, and the um, oftentimes, in fact, if many of the, uh, the strains, most of the time, they sort of hang out near the migration, um, um, near the migration floor, um, but they occasionally then bloom up to high uh, um, abundances. Now the blooms are high abundances, that of course happens on a linear scale because what comes into this is on a linear scale. So these blooms then will actually dominate the average. If I look at this strain and I look at the average, it's gonna be dominated by the bits when it's way up here. So at any given time, only a small number of islands will, uh, um, will dominate, okay? And those crucial then are the blooms because of course it's when it blooms that it can give um, a migrants into the other islands. When it's down here, it's not gonna give much migration. It doesn't matter much, but when it's up here, it's important. When it's up here, of course, also when it has the biggest effects on the other strings. Okay, um, so the, um, um, the, the this crucial bit is going to be understanding some of what these blooms uh, um, uh, blooms are and how they get there, and they get there in a, a very irregular um, way, as you can see from the wiggles um, uh, uh, wiggles in here. Okay, so these blooms then, as they dominate the um, average, the dominant uh, average of the islands, they also dominate the average over the um, um, uh, over time, so they also dominate the average of nu i alpha on the one island of t averaged over time, and I'm going to use this angular brackets to mean average over um, um, average over over time. 
So they'll dominate this. And then of course, since all the islands are equivalent, something that over all the islands will give you, um, should give you this island, uh, um, um, uh, this island average. Okay. Okay, so how do we um, um, understand this behavior? So the, the goal is to try to understand this, uh, um, um, uh, this behavior. Okay. Well, the nice thing here is that we can do a systematic uh, um, a theory of this. And the systematic theory is strictly valid in the limit that the number of strains goes to infinity and the number of islands goes to infinity. Initially, we'll also take the population size to infinity, but we can um, uh, handle that um, um, afterwards. And this is coming under the general approach is make things as simple as possible and then add features. And of course, one of the features we want to be able to add is local, uh, um, uh, local extinctions. Even with the deterministic dynamics, so when n is infinite, I can still have global extinctions. I can have all the strains on all the islands, one strain on all the islands just keeping coming down and, uh, um, and die out. So I can still have the global, uh, um, um, global extinctions. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, what we do, as I mentioned in the last time, is we focus on one type, one strain on one uh, um, island, so that's um, um, uh, alternating between strains and types. Um, so one strain, strain i on one island. And since the statistics are independent of the island, I'm just going to drop the um, alpha index and there and call it mu i. So we have this, the dynamics of this has several, uh, um, um, has several parts. Okay. So first it's got the sort of obvious things in its uh, growth rate. So here it's growth rate, it's got the SI, it's got this interaction with itself, if we take uh, that into account. But then it has, um, and then it's got the Lagrange multiplier, which keeps the population on the island uh, um, uh, constant. Okay. And then it's got the migration coming from all, all the other islands um, and the migration out um, from there. Okay. But then the effects of all of the interactions with all the others are coming from these two pieces uh, here. And I've shown this piece with a double minus sign because gamma is negative. So this overall sign will be, um, um, will be negative, um, negative there. Okay, so what are, um, what are these? Okay, so the way we try, you could try to understand this is we add a type and we add one type, um, an, an, a new type, and I'm gonna call that um, a type uh, um, a type zero, um, just to distinguish it from the uh, um, others. So we put that in and we ask, what are the effects of the others? Okay, so the effects of the others, um, um, all the other ones on the same islands, of the others, what will they do? Well, the effects of the others will give it a, an effect in its uh, um, uh, growth rate, um, which is going to be, it's going to be where the zeta naught is going to come from. Okay, and that's going to be the sum over all the other strains of V naught J times nu J of, uh, of T. So that's going to be the, 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 the sum of the others. And this is going to be something which is going to be approximately Gaussian. It's the sum of a large number of things. The Vs are independent. So there's a large number of things. This is going to be approximately, um, um, this is going to be approximately Gaussian. Okay. And it's going to be Gaussian and it's going to have some correlations. So it's going to have mean zero. So the, the average is going to be zero. Um, equals zero, and then it's going to have some um, covariance. So it's going to have a covariance, which we're going to call C of T and T prime, okay, which is going to be the average of the um, zeta of, uh, um, of, of T, um, uh, zeta of T prime. Okay, now that zeta, of course, because we've got the, um, the, the this is coming in for the zeros, that's going to have a, um, a zero in it. Um, but the statistics of it is going to be the same for, um, um, uh, for all of them. Okay, but we'll have to um, think carefully about what the effects of the, um, the particular type um, are. Okay. So that's the one type. Okay, So that's this part um, here, how it's interacting. Okay. But then there is a really crucial part. And the really crucial part is the feedback of this on the other types, on the other strains. Okay. Where is that feedback going to um, uh, uh, going to come from? Okay. So I now imagine that, that this new new is now growing. So it has some time dependence, and we're going to want to look at its effects on the presence of the future. So we've got new um, the new naught, um, which is going to um, have some um, time dependence, and I'm going to look at this say in the past. So I'm going to call that uh, um, uh, t prime. And what does that do? Well, what this will give rise to, this will give rise to an extra force on the other islands, 
So this will give rise to on each of the other islands, it will give some delta j, to j zeta j of uh, um, at that time. Okay, and what's that going to be? Well, what that's going to be, that's going to be equal to then the just the sum, sorry, the vj naught is coming from this island times nu naught of, uh, of t prime. Okay, so that's going to be the, uh, um, uh, the zeta. Okay. Now, what's that going to do? Well, that's going to change the new j on the, of the other strain. So this is going to then result in a change. This is going to result in a change. Okay, delta new j. Okay, and we're interested in what that change can be at later times. So this, of course, can be at later times there with the t bigger than t prime. So that's its effect. Okay, well, what will its effect be? Well, roughly speaking, the effect of each one on each of the others is small because they're a very large number and there's a total number, the effect of each one is small. So we can approximate this effect here of this delta nu j. Is it gonna be the extra force, which is the zeta j times delta, the derivative of nu j at t with respect to zeta j at t prime. Okay, so this is like the response. This is the response of, uh, um, of J to the um, changing the force on it, changing the zeta on it, right? Because the other ones, this is the force um, that the other ones are feeling. Um, we've now got the other ones that are feeling they are those. And so they'll get this extra force. Okay? So this is the, the effects of there. But what does this do? This is now change the new J. So the changing of the new J then, that'll give us a, a, a change back of the, an extra sort of force on, on new naught, but now this force on new naught is going to be at this later time. Well, well how is it going to do that? Well, that's just got the vj naught. We've now just got to sum this up here. Okay, so we've now got this is v naught j, so it's the feedback back coming on this, and then we've got the sum over all, uh, um, all j. Okay, so that's our extra force that we're going to uh, um, um, that we're going to get. That's the extra force back on the uh, um, 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 on new naught. Okay, so what is that term? This term is going to have some average value. Why is it going to have an average value? Because we've got these two things here, which are correlated. This one is correlated with that. And then it's correlated exactly with this parameter um, um, uh, gamma. Okay, so what is this going to? Uh, um, uh, this is going to be in the limit of lo large numbers. Then this is going to be just the sum on j. Okay, of now we're going to get this parameter gamma coming from that averaging times this um, average of nu um, uh, j with respect to um, uh, zeta j at t in t prime. Okay, and this is then going to be times, um, and this is going to be then um, our quantity, which is just going to be r of t t prime, okay, times the new naught. At uh, um, uh, sorry, the, the new order of the t prime I've got I'm already there. Okay, so this is the quantity here. What this is here is this is this whole bit um, uh, coming in here. So this is this whole part. All of that is going to come down and give us the r. Okay, and sorry, I've got the gamma in the r, um, um, the r there. Um, so I've got the gamma times the um, um, the r. Okay, so what is the R? R is then going to have to be equal to this. Okay, so we now have a self consistency condition. So the crucial part here is we have the self consistency conditions. Self consistency for this approximation. And that's that statistically all the, the strains are equivalent. So there's nothing special about this one that I called uh, um, zero. So this self consistency has to be that this R. So here I applied the R into this equation. I applied the R, I applied the zeta. The zeta had some correlations. The R was a coming from a response, right? So this R here is a response. So that's the response, okay? And the C here is the correlations. Okay, so those have to be determined uh, um, um, uh, self-consistently, and th those are the zeta, and of course, then this, I have to determine the self-consistently, so I have to find the statistics of each of the new j, statistics for each of those. 
I have to compute the correlations and then the self consistency is that C of T and T prime is going to be the sum on J of the um, average of mu J of T um, mu J of T prime. Okay. And this is then the average over all of the noise. So this is really the average over all of the effects of the, um, uh, of the zeta j. Okay, so that's, that's the correlation function. And then I have similar for the response function, which I've already uh, um, um, written loud in terms of this, which is the sum on j of the uh, um, d mu. T prime, and then obviously I have to integrate those effects over all previous uh, um, over all previous times. Okay, so the effect in here, this is the effects of all the others. It's a Gaussian random variable with with, with correlations in it. I've got this response from the feedback of I on the other types and back again on the on type I. This is of course time lagged. There can be general time lag there, so it's integral all the way up to uh, um, T. And the coefficient of that coming from the correlations in the V's. Of the effect of i on j and the effect j on back on i has this uh, um, coefficient here um, minus uh, um, gamma. So this is a negative effect. So this is a feedback effect that stops mu getting large. Okay. So this effect here, this effect here, really is this kill the winner, um, um, uh, kill the winner effect. Okay. The effect on the others is the when the new i is big. So when new i gets large, that has the effects on the others they then do well and they give the feedback on this. Okay, so that brings it back down again and that's responsible for the, um, this dynamics up here. That's crucially responsible for this part here, which is the turnaround and stops them getting too big. Okay. If I do have the Q as well, the Q also of course stops them um, um, getting too big, but uh, for most of the time at least, we're just gonna um, um, ignore this term. Um, and um, um, it doesn't matter unless it's particularly large. Okay, so it has to be larger than the other effects to matter. And I say that's corresponding to assuming niche, niches, which we specifically don't want, to, uh, um, uh, don't want to do. Okay, so this is the basic structure then of the, um, of the dynamical um, I mean field theory. Um, just one more second. Um, um, this is the, the basic structure of the, of the dynamical field, mil, field dynamical mean field theory. And now our task is a simple task, seemingly simple task, that one has to figure out then self-consistently these, uh, um, uh, these two functions. And so we have to get these, once we figured out the new, we assume something and then we solve, okay? Then we've got an additional self-consistency. We then with the migration, so if I then plus adding the migration, Okay, so how do I do that? I assume some new i um, bar, generally will be dependent on t. So I assume some new i bar, then I compute, I get the actual new i's coming, um, uh, coming out from, uh, um, from that. And then this has to be equal to uh, um, that. So I compute the new, um, and then I have to make it self consistent. So the time average of the, uh, um, um, of the new, well, sorry, that's actually it's the average of the islands. Um, um, the one over i times the sum on the islands of, uh, of new i has to be equal to new bar. Okay, and of course I need to adjust that. So I assume new bar, I get a new i, and then I have to adjust until I get this. Okay, so what's gonna happen? Well, there are gonna be some news which go extinct. So sometimes we will get that this will go extinct. Um, and so I'll have some fraction here where it's uh, um, extinct. So some strains with no solution which is big, bigger those and those go globally extinct. Sorry, Daniel. Daniel, can, yes. can I make a question? So, yes. Uh, so the nu i are uh, broadly distributed. Uh, you said that uh, at any given time uh, there is one uh, few few of them that will dominate the sum. Yes. Right? Yes. Well, so is this approach uh, 
uh, does is there any problem with this approach where you take uh, where you assume essentially that uh, things are self averaging yes. yes so the condition that one needs is that the number which are large at any time is big and the number which is large at any time is basically going to be the total number divided by this factor because they're roughly uniform on that scale so the condition we actually need is not that k be much bigger than one, but k be much bigger than this parameter here, this, this log. Okay, but this is this is a, you know, a modestly a modestly large parameter. In practice, the with you know in modest k that one can see this a phase. So like I've got here, in practice, it often is only dominated by a few of them. Okay, so this is not in the regime where the mean field theory is strictly valid. And associated with that also, we have these fluctuations because the number of islands is not very large. Okay. So this is showing from modest numbers, one can do it for larger numbers, and there's ways of trying to get um, um, convergence numerically. So that's a good, a good point, is that strictly speaking, I did have many large at the same time. However, it turns out they turn around fast enough that only having a small number large at the same time, the behavior is essentially the same. But that's one of those things that we can put in afterwards and understand, uh, um, um, understand that. Yeah, thank you. That's an important question. There's a raised hand by Armu. Oh, yeah. Um... I guess, could you remind me what you took to infinity um, in terms yeah. of population? So the thing that I took to infinity is k to infinity. So that gets around this problem that Matteo just, um, just raised. That means I always have a large number of, um, um, affecting all the others. And that's coming in here, the fact that I've got a sum over large number of roughly independent things. Okay. Um, so the, and then the, I also took the number of islands to, um, um, uh, to infinity. Um, and the reason I can do that is then I can treat the um, self-consistently of the number of islands. I can treat this as something which doesn't depend much on the islands. These are going to be roughly independent of each other because of the, the chaos, the un uncorrelated chaos. And so I'll get something which is well-behaved average there. But again, one can, I'll, I'll make something you can go on number of islands. So then the Lagrange multiplier then, what, at what level is it keeping... Um... The, the, okay, so I also have to adjust the uh, um, uh, the epsilon. Okay, I need to adjust that um, that as well. That I can do as I go along with the um, um, uh, with the dynamics. It's part of the same uh, um, same thing. So I better put that also in uh, um, um, in here. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm finding the new of x. This is I get this, and I also get uh, um, um, I also have to get the um, epsilon of t. Sorry for not having said that on that part. Thank you. The upsilon t um, will be because again the, the the large number of types in the statistics being the same. The upsilon t can be the same on each island after um, transients. Thank so you. I'm now, I'm now going to simplify um, uh, simplify things. So some strains have gone um, globally extinct, and then the assumption is that the rest go to a, a, a statistical steady state. Okay, the statistical steady state, and that means that, for example, the correlation function will just be a f function of t minus t prime. Okay, the response function will also just be response function of t minus t prime. Okay, the um, upsilon will be a, a approximately constant. Okay. So I'll have a, th those, uh, um, uh, those simplifications and each new bar, it'll still depend on I, okay? Um, this will also go to a, a, a constant, but depends on I, depends on the strain. Okay, but it'll lose its time dependence. So now I've got a time translation variant problem and I can try to solve that, okay? Now I would just like to make a side note for people who've seen the dynamic mean field theory in spin glass context or other contexts. Usually in people, the situations people do, you can take these um, a correlation response function, you can go back in and work it out and you can directly get a self-consistent equation for the correlation response function. And once you've done that, you no longer need to do the stochastic dynamics. Here, we don't have that behavior. Here, you have to do the full stochastic dynamics. You have to assume a zeta. You have to do the stochastic dynamics, understand the statistics of the new, get the average of it, get the correlations of it. These quantities here both have long tails in time. This has a long tail in time. This has long tails in time. And you have to work through those self-consistently. And that's what's hard. 
Okay, so the, the real challenge here is sort of the applied math problem now of going and trying to understand this um, uh, self consistently. So that's the, done in, in detail in this uh, um, 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 in the PNAS paper. So we have to assume we get a steady state and then we work out all of these things self consistently. Okay? So what I want to just do is I want to do a bit of the, um, uh, a bit of the heuristics um, to give a flavor of, of that. And since the, the distributions are on the broad, the natural thing is to look at the log variables, to look on a log scale. Okay, so I'm going to define Li is going to be um, the log of a new i. Okay, so L actually got, I mean, goes negative because the new is bounded by, um, the new is bounded by one. And then I can write that I've got the log I um, um, uh, dot here. So this is now just going, um, uh, just going up and down. So it has this part coming from the, um, uh, the zeta I um, of T minus the um, epsilon, which is roughly a constant. And then it has this feedback um, effect of the, uh, um, of the R times the um, up to T. Um, this is now t minus t prime of uh, um, the n. Well, what is the n? The n is going to be e to the now l at an earlier time, right? And there you see the exponential weighting, if you like, in terms of the natural variables, which are the, um, uh, the l's. Okay, then there's going to be part, the other part, which is just going to be the minus the migration out. But then the important thing is that the migration in, the migration in has this average coming in um, here, which is now just a constant. But now, of course, that's divided by n. So that means it has an e to the minus l here. Okay, has an e to the minus l of t. Okay, so these are all functions of t. Has an e to the minus l of t. So what does this do? Okay, this one here cuts it off at the top end, right? When l gets large, it cuts it off. This one here gives you a floor that you're not likely to go down much below this. Okay, so this term here, this term here keeps L usually being um, uh, bigger um, than um, log one over M times this new I bar. Okay, so what is that? That's this exactly in this picture, um, uh, this picture here. That's exactly what this floor is. So that's this floor, which is set by, uh, um, um, which is set by this. We have to adjust that floor self consistently. If this is a not very good type, then I'll go up and come down. Okay. Oh, and I should, I, let me put in the, uh, um, leave in the SI um, um, in here. Okay. So what do I want to do? Well, I want to divide this into two things. I want to look at this, and then it's going to have some average value. Okay. So in the steady state, that's going to have some average value, but that's going to depend on I. So I have a quantity then, which I'm going to call psi i. Okay, and that's going to have several parts. It's going to be si plus the average over time. So this is going to be the average over time, um, the um, uh, minus the epsilon. Okay, and then of course I've also got a part of the zeta which isn't average over time. So I've got an extra part which doesn't average. Um, so I can write zeta as the average um, uh, zeta plus some. Eta, where the average of eta equals zero. Okay, so I have some other part there, and the eta has the correlations associated with the remainder part of the uh, um, of this. Okay. So now this will depend upon the i, and this I'm going to call the bias. Okay, what is that? Well, in connection of things that Stefano Alcina talked about, what this is, this is just the invasion eigenvalue from small numbers. Why is that? Well, if I look back up at my um, equation here, if I look where nu is small, and it's been small in the past, this is what's going to determine how it invades. Okay, so this is exactly the invasion uh, um, uh, 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 the invasion eigenvalue. Okay, so this is the invasion eigenvalue. Okay. Now the surprising thing is. Well, the not surprising thing is if, if, if minus psi i, if it's strongly negative, if it's strongly negative, they'll get they go extinct. Okay, but psi i can be less than zero, but bigger than some critical, um, um, uh, critical value, which is negative. It can be in that range. It can still persist. Okay, so a crucial thing here is even things that are biased downwards on average, 
even things that are biased downwards on average can um, persist. And in fact, they can be biased down quite strongly on, uh, um, 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 on average. And the reason that they, um, um, uh, that they persist, sorry, um, the reason that they persist here is associated with what this uh, um, um, uh, form is here of what comes up. Okay. So even though on average they're going downwards, they're being pushed down towards there, they've got um, this effect here which stops them. Okay. But in order for that to work, in order for that to work, they have to burst upwards. So they have to, even though they hang out down near here, if the psi is quite strongly negative, they hang out down near here, but occasionally they burst upwards. Those blooms are crucial. Without those blooms, you don't survive. Okay. So you need to keep the new eye bar up, you have to um, bloom, and in order for this to happen, they need to have occasional blooms. Okay, and those blooms then is what dominates the new eye, um, uh, the new eye ball. Okay, so you work have to work out the statistics of those blooms. That's a, that, that's subtle, and the reason that's subtle is that these R and Cs have long range uh, um, uh, correlations in time. So the R and the C here and the correlation function both have long range correlations in time. They decay with a two thirds exponent over some range. They have two other different regimes as well, um, and it gets and life gets very complicated. But the crucial thing is one has to understand the statistics of these blooms. Okay, and that's a rare event. Uh, um, um, uh, calculation, and they say this is coming from this is going to be the average of e to the li, right? And so it's the exponentially weighted average is dominated by when the l is anomalously close to zero, anomalously low. Okay, so this is now uh, uh, um, the um, uh, this is now the the problem that one has to uh, um, uh, that one has to solve. Okay, so I'm not going to go into more of that. This gives you a sort of qualitative picture of the. Uh, um, a behavior. Um, it turns out that most of them actually persist with most of the parameter range unless the migration gets large. You actually get most of them persi persisting. Only a few of them um, uh, uh, go extinct. Most of them persist. You can work out what this is, how it depends on the parameters, at least roughly. So this is all doing asymptotics. There's almost no things you can write down exactly. You can write down sort of bounds on things which really give you useful results. But the crucial thing is understanding the statistics of these blooms. The crucial thing is seeing how they give rise to long time correlations in the response and correlation functions. Okay, so that's that. That's the basic uh, um, um, uh, basic behavior. Okay, so I just want to I think add a um, add a page here. Um, okay. Okay. So what we want to just ask about is the robustness of this phase. Okay. So um, uh, Roy, Felix Roy and collaborators have looked at this um, for gamma equals zero, so independent interactions and um, Q being uh, um, uh, positive, but not um, uh, too large. Um, well, it's, it's order K, root K, but not, um, not too large, okay? And they find similar behavior. There's some um, differences associated with what happens, how they turn around when they get large. So if something comes up and when it gets large, it's turned around by the cue um, rather than by the response, but uh, rather than by the feedback, but the behavior is qualitatively similar. Okay, so it seems as if this actually applies over very large parts of the sort of phase diagram in the basic, uh, um, basic model. Okay. So that's one part, but another part of looking at the robustness is what happens if I have finite number of islands. Okay, so if it's finite n, finite um, population on each island, okay, then if, um, if mn, so the total migration into each island is large, okay, then it's still okay. You, so ex, some extra ones um, uh, go extinct, but most of the strains still um, persist. Okay, a few extras go extinct if the new bar falls below one over n. Okay, as I had in the figure. Finite number of islands, and finite number of islands as well. Then what you do is you get the, the, the survival time, um, the uh, survival time in this population goes as e to the um, i um, uh, uh, number of islands, so exponentially long divided by some characteristic scale, which depends upon the bias of that type. It depends on log m, and it depends on log n. And again, figuring out what this uh, um, um, this is takes quite a bit of uh, um, uh, quite a bit of work. Okay, and one can check that numerically: ten islands and you know a hundred types 
um, I've forgotten what it is, 80 or something like that, have survived very long times. And some of them will survive, I say, exponentially long times as the number of ions get large. Okay. So even though this is asymptotics, and in fact, it's asymptotics in log variables, in some sense, it's asymptotics in log variables, it turns out that it's very uh, um, robust and so works over large, large ranges. We could add other features. We could add in um, some extra environmental stochasticity. We could add slight differences from island to island. Um, uh, uh, Felix and, and company have looked a bit at uh, that. And again, the behavior seems to persist. So we really seem to have this robust phase for an assembled community with correlations in the interactions which are not strongly competitive, right? Gamma being positive, it's gone for more competitive interactions this certainly is going to persist for some positive gamma. We may persist in some sense all the way up to gamma just below one, um, but that we don't know yet. Okay, so we don't know how persistent this will be if I put in, say, interactions via um, chemicals in the, uh, um, um, in the environment. So that's still a lot of questions associated with that. Okay. So I want to um, um, to talk in the last bit about uh, um, um, whether this such a community can um, um, can evolve. But let me just pause here if there are questions at this uh, um, um, at this stage. Um, and I say I certainly don't expect you to understand this in, in detail, but to understand sort of the spirit and how one does the the calculations and sort of the heuristics. Okay. So let's now ask the absolutely crucial question. We assume it was an assembled community. We let things go extinct, it stayed, but we want to know, is this phase stable to evolution? Okay, and also can evolution give, uh, um, uh, give rise to this? Okay. So how do I want to, um, uh, want to evolve it? I want to take, just choose some strain I. Um, okay, so I'm to, we're going to first look at this. We're going to look at slow evolution. That's the hardest case as far as the um, things persisting. So we're gonna add one mutant at a time, uh, one mutant at a time, and we're gonna take type I and it's gonna to mutate to some type um, um, I tilde. So this is the mutant, it has a given parent and these will be correlated in some way. Their S's and the V's will be correlated in some way with a strength, with a strength rho. So root one minus rho squared is essentially like the difference between them, um, between the, the parent and the mutant. Okay? Now one has to do these correlations in the right way to keep the sort of cystics and so on um, in there. This bit we have some um, analytic understanding of it mostly, um, um, uh, uh, mostly numerical okay. at this stage. Okay, so this is now looking at the, um, what, uh, the, what happens. So I start with some number of types here. I start with number, some number of strains initially here. Those, uh, um, some fraction go extinct. So there's the rapid extinction here on the ecological time scales. Then we, we let it equilibrate and then we add one more. Okay, so we've added this mutant. We let it then equilibrate. Um, that'll drive some extinctions. Um, possibly some new extinctions. And of course, a crucial thing, if we're adding one, sometimes it'll drive the parent out, but much of the time, the parent and the offspring um, coexist and the mutant um, uh, coexist. They're slightly different from, um, uh, uh, from each other. Okay. And then I pick another random parent, I do the same thing again. So this is looking what, uh, um, uh, what happens. And if you start with a small number of types, you tend to get that it goes extinct. If you start with an intermediate number, it sort of fluctuates around and then starts uh, um, going up. And if you start with larger numbers, it just goes up. So this suggests that there's sort of roughly a threshold at which you need a threshold in the complexity that you need before it starts to take off. Now, where this is, it will depend upon the migration rate. It depends on much more details about the uh, model. We don't understand this quantitatively. We understand qualitatively what's associated with it. Okay? So when you go in here, the number of types tends to plummet. If you start with small numbers, you basically, it's exponentially rare um, in a small, a large exponential factor in order to get up and get going. Okay, so this behavior one won't see unless one sort of gets the community going in some way. But one could do that in various, uh, um, um, uh, various ways we haven't explored in detail. 
Okay. There's a very subtle thing, and this is what Aditya um, Mahadevan is working on, as to how the invasions actually occur. So how does a new type come in? And that turns out to be rather hard. And the, if it's too close to his parent, it's even, it's even harder. Um, for this, we haven't uh, ex um, explored the details of that um, yet, but say that we're working on now. Okay. So what happens? Is this something which is persistent? Well, here's now looking on longer time scales. So this is, of course, sometimes the, it doesn't invade at all, I should say. Um, sometimes the mutant doesn't come in. Um, so equilibrate often the parent mutant, mutant some that sometimes, um, or even often, the mutant fails and doesn't invade. And sometimes it does. Um, if does, sometimes it replaces the parent. Can replace the parent. Okay. So what happens then? Well, depending on what the correlation is, so this is now putting in independent ones that's assembling the community more. This is very highly correlated ones, tiny differences between the parent and the offspring. Um, there, you don't really see much happening yet. Um, mostly happens here is that the, the, the mutants replace the, the parent. But as soon as you get, you decrease the correlations by a tiny bit, you started getting systematically going upwards. So you get systematically growth in the diversity of the community. And typically in this regime here, roughly for each one that you add, you lose a half. Um, and so you just go up at a steady uh, um, rate. Actually, for, for these ones, sorry. Um, um, are you going faster than that? Okay. So this, this tends to come up fast. You get the community, which gets richer and richer as it goes along. Okay. However, this here, we assume there were no generalist mutations. What does that mean? You can do better in general by having all of your Vs larger or having all the Vs against you being less negative, okay? But the bigger the population, the number of the community is the less likely you are to have that, uh, um, um, uh, to have that happen. Okay, so this has no generalist uh, mutations. What do I mean? We mean that the SIs, there's no SIs, the SIs are all zero. Okay, and SI would just mean that you'd better in general. If your SI is bigger than your parent, you're doing better your, than your parent in general. Okay. So what happens now if we put in generalist mutations? Okay. So we're gonna do this, but we're gonna make a variance of the sigmas. Um, uh, so the variance of the sigmas is gonna be much less than uh, um, uh, one. That's the assumption initially that things are already pretty well adapted. They're pretty well adapted, but what then happens is you can still go out into the tail. So if I look at the distribution of the, uh, um, of the S's, so I look at the distribution of the uh, um, S's here, distribution of the, uh, the S's. So that's, I'll say it's some Gaussian, um, uh, Gaussian distribution initially, okay? Well, even very early on, if I look at the ones that, uh, um, that survive, I'll tend to not, most of these ones down here won't survive. So they'll go, um, uh, they'll go extinct. And as I go up, I will start to get um, as, I, as I evolve and start to add types, I'll start to get that this distribution will tend to concentrate more and more towards the tail. As I go up further, it'll concentrate even more towards the tail and it'll keep creeping up towards the tail. So this I go with successive, um, uh, successive invasions. Um, I go along and I start pushing it out towards the tail. Okay. What happens then is one can see that um, and you can look at the um, uh, the correlations here, if you look at the mean of the, pop, the um, S's that come in, so this is the generalist mutations, then you, that, that goes gradually upwards. You push further and further out into the, uh, um, further and further out into the tail, okay? The process also gets slower and slower because if you're an S here, if you find a smaller S, most of the time your mutant will have a smaller S, right? So when, once you get up in this regime here, okay, the most of the mutants, um, um, in fact, even the successful mutants. So the S of the mutant will be less than the S of the parent. Nevertheless, if it has good Vs, if it has good interactions, it can, uh, um, uh, it can invade. Okay? But generally it's more likely to invade if its S is, uh, um, S is larger because it's got an overall average, high average growth rate or higher bias. So what happens in this case is it continues to diversify. It continues to diversify, it just gets slower and slower. So it's harder and harder to invade it slows down, but we have a um, analytic understanding of this. And for at least for the Gaussian tails here, it should keep on growing um, um, indefinitely. 
um, but um, just getting more gradually slower and slower. Okay, so even if you allow the generalist mutations, this phase can still exist. It evolves more slowly. It gets harder and harder to invade. That's of course a general property. If the things have evolved for the same in constant conditions, it will tend to get harder for new things to come in. Interestingly, if you didn't put specifically these generalist mutations in, that doesn't really matter. This just keeps on going up and the statistics don't change substantially. And the reason sort of is, is there are so many ways to do well up here that uh, um, it doesn't really, it doesn't, doesn't really gain to sort of do better um, overall. You do better about whichever the current ones, uh, um, uh, current ones are. So it keeps going up uh, um, in a steady rate. A substantial fraction of all of the invaders can, uh, um, uh, can come in. When I get down here, most invaders fail. So most mutants fail, but you get, um, uh, you get, you get some and you, this will continue to grow. And this only grows logarithmically in, uh, um, um, uh, logarithmically in time. Could I ask a question? Yes. So if you, uh, so on some of these speakers, the x-axis is successful invasions and some of them is time. So is time the same as attempted invasions or? Yeah, this is, uh, what, this is uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so this time here, this is proportional to attempted, um, attempted invasions. And we haven't put in all the subtleties which you've thought about of, the, of that invasion process. Um, we allow them to come in at substantial numbers to make, it, uh, um, um, uh, uh, to, to make it easier to run things at a reasonable time. Okay, so this is the number of, of attempted invasions. Sorry, I should have said that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're not allowing reinvasion. So if something goes extinct, it stays extinct. So if you drive extinctions, then the um, um, they, they'll stay. They'll stay extinct. Okay, other other questions here. Okay. So if um, the the last thing I want to um, uh, talk about. And again, there's even less of just a tiny bit of a flavor on it is the question about the interactions. Okay, so everything we've done so far, everything we've done so far is that the phenotype of type I is defined by the interactions. Okay, so by the whole set of Vij with all of the others and the, and the, um, and similarly, so this is the phenotype uh, of, of type I. So that's a very weird thing to do. We can't just, we shouldn't be defining our phenotype by interactions. We should define it by some properties of the organism. Okay, so we want to look at phenotype models where the interactions are determined by properties of the organisms. Okay, so for this, I'm going to go explicitly back to the bacteria and phage model. So I have now bacterial strains whole bunch of bacterial strains indexed by I, phage strains indexed here by ML, and the populations um, of the bacteria and the phage, and the bacteria dynamics, um, uh, uh, growth rate, um, killing by the phages, so the H's are all positive, um, competition with the other bacteria, uniform competition, no niche-like interactions. The phages will die without food, they will then grow with the uh, um, uh, defects of bacteria, and the specificity to the extent that there is, is contained in these. Okay, and these then will have some average value. This is one species of phage, one species of uh, bacteria, right? So these are both of them a, a one, uh, um, a one species um, uh, of each and just strains. So they're not specialists. They're of course they could evolve to be specialists, but we don't start off with them being, uh, um, being specialists. Okay, so what will the correlations look like? Will there be some average value, the F? And then if they're only slightly different from each other, there'll be some small variations, delta F and delta H, okay? And these will be, um, uh, those will be strongly correlated. Okay, now wh where do we think these are coming from? Well, this is now where I'm gonna put in the phenotype, okay? So I'm gonna put a D-dimensional phenotype, okay? And if you like, crudely, this is the, this is the, this is the A is labeling the amino acids in a crude way in a receptor. So the bacteria has a receptor the phage has a tail and the tail binds to the receptor and depending on how well it binds, that'll determine it. So we're doing the absolutely simplest thing here. There is only one phenotypic property of each. The bacteria has a receptor, the phage has a tail. That's a D-dimensional thing, so it's just a string of numbers. The, and then the binding strength is just the, the I'm defining these in a way that they have energies. So it's just the binding between these. So this is the binding strength of the um, phage tail of type L to the bacteria of type I. 
And then I'm going to assume that what their interactions do, what this, this interaction do, they, they will give rise through some function, just some function, the way that the bacteria harm the phage and the way that the phage feed on the bacteria. Okay, so the simplest thing to do would be to assume that it's a linear, um, um, a linear function. So the simplest is if this is linear. Okay, so if this is linear, linear, then I get a low rank matrix. So my rate matrix of interactions, my matrix of interactions is gonna end up being low rank. Okay, and then you can't get much diversity. It's gonna be rank D um, limits the diversity. Okay. But what if I put in something which is somewhat more biologically, um, uh, biologically motivated? So if I look at what the effects of the, of the phage are on the bacteria, you know, if they don't bind much, it doesn't do much. Um, if they bind um, strongly, it, it, it does something. And if they bind more strongly, it sort of saturates. Once they're being killed, they're killed. It doesn't matter. Okay. For the phage, I want to put in a bit um, different function. Again, it's going to have this, um, um, uh, this behavior. Um, it's going to have similar behavior um, down here. Of course, it only affects it when the bacteria does, so it'll start coming up. Okay. But one can imagine this will keep coming up harder. How well it binds might more strongly affect the, uh, um, um, the phage. It can keep doing better even once the bacteria has already um, died because it can get in more effectively and so on and maybe produce more. So these functions are different from uh, um, each other, but the fact that I've both got functions, they both depend on the, uh, um, on the same thing. So they both depend on the Gs, right? This implies that these are correlated. Of course, it forces correlations in there. Okay, but it's correlated just coming from this phenotype and I can look at it being in there, okay? So the only thing I know so far, roughly, is that if, um, uh, if D is bigger than about six, this is just numerically, um, uh, D is bigger than around six, so very low dimensional phenotypes. And, you, and for some functions H and uh, um, uh, of G and F of G, at least for some functions, you get diversity continues to grow. So you get the similar behavior to uh, um, what I showed uh, um, um, up here, you get similar behavior to what uh, um, um, goes on, on here. You actually don't get this, you actually get something which is more like this. You get something more like this case, it's sort of bouncing around quite a lot. Sometimes it can have plunges, but it keeps on going up. Okay. So this leads rise to a very interesting conjecture that even with a low dimensional phenotype, okay, so D is not large, D is gonna be some modest number, even with a low dimensional phenotype, and then deterministic um, interactions that are determined just by those phenotypes, that looks as if it give, can give rise to a continuously um, um, increasing phase, and it is of this, this spatial temporally chaotic phase. Okay, so it really is this, uh, um, um, this phase. And in fact, they do tend to do somewhat better as generalists, they, the back phage particularly tend to do somewhat uh, um, push towards the upper um, upper end, but nevertheless, they don't become so generalist that that's, that limits the uh, um, diversity and they don't become particularly specialist either. You can look at the specialist and generalist correlation. Okay. So what have I um, um, done? I hope I've, I've um, got across some things. So the first thing is the value of trying to look at really simple models to get an idea of what can happen. And if something can happen in a simple model, then I would say that's not so surprising that we might see it in, in uh, nature. It doesn't mean we understand it, but it means we are not so surprised. Okay. There was one um, uh, uh, quantus I looked at uh, on the first day, um, which I've already sort of summarized as far as looking at evolution in a, a sort of snowscape where you continually change it. Okay. But the bit which ties much more into this um, school generally is the last two days where I've looked at these random lotka Volterra models I motivated the randomness is coming from strains that were very closely um, related. So things were sums and differences of uh, um, the two effects. They were not much um, different overall. So the SIs were small. There were no niche interactions. I did not assume anything special about the interactions of a strain with its siblings being any stronger on average than its interactions with its 23rd cousins. Okay. 
So that was that, that was the basic model. And then in those models, we now have a solid analysis and a very good theoretical understanding of the spatially temporal chaotic phase that can exist in those when the correlations are in this anti-symmetric direction, but it seems to persist more generally if I have a bit of niche interactions or interactions via chemicals, which will give rise to uh, that with via resources which you're trying to conserve. Okay. So that's the part which is, which is uh, solid. Um, and one can think about what its predictability is for, um, uh, for nature. One thing I forgot to um, um, say in talking about that um, uh, robustness um, was that we would really like to add, um, um, or put it in as a question mark, um, real spatial structure so that my um, uh, interaction, my things can't move all over the place. And this is particularly um, relevant in the, uh, um, uh, in the ocean where things are getting moved around by uh, um, uh, turbulence. Okay, and so certainly if one wants to make contact with reality, one has to think about, um, think about it. Okay. The other bits on this question about it can, whether it can evolve, it is certainly again possible that these models can evolve higher and higher um, diversity. Under what circumstances that tends to get slower and slower, we don't, uh, we don't know. Um, the specific assumptions about everything, interact with everything that is responsible for some of that slowing down. And if one goes away from that and looks at more sort of hierarchical interactions, like I guess Joshua Waits particularly talked about, then uh, um, maybe the diversity can increase more, um, uh, more easily. Okay. And then the very last bit, which is even more speculative in connection with these phenotype models, is that you do not need high dimensional nano phenotype to get diversity, okay? So in my sense in which I talked about before of what matters, this is the dimension of the nano phenotype, right? So this was the nano, uh, um, uh, the nano phenotype. Um, uh, it's the only things that matter in this, uh, um, uh, in this model, which is determine how they interact with each other. And that's sufficient, at least in principle, to give rise to increasing, uh, um, uh, increasing diversity. And you don't need to have high dimension, um, um, high dimensions to do that. Okay. This turned out to be somewhat hard to find if you, if you choose the wrong, um, the wrong functions or if you choose functions that maybe are nicer than the one, more reasonable than the ones which, which I used, it's going to be harder to get it. But uh, um, um, I think that's, there's a lot to be still understood in, uh, in this. So there's a huge number of open questions, a lot of interesting directions. Some of those are trying to, uh, um, um, trying to pursue and there's still more needed on understanding the things that I have, uh, um, um, have talked about. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop, uh, um, stop there and apologies for going on um, too long and for going too fast on, uh, um, um, on much of it. But as I hope I at least got some of the flavor, uh, flavor across. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. That's, uh... See whether there are any further questions from the audience. So you mentioned if you change H of G and F of G, that is it, so that does that increase the um, the dimension needed to have uh, diversity? Well, it, it does increase the dimension, and it's not clear with at least some H and G, which sort of are reasonable forms, it's not clear you actually get this diversification at all. What you do is you get things that look more like, uh, um, uh, more like this. You start with a, uh, some number, you know, the numbers sort of hang out for a while, maybe it gets a bit more diverse and then it crashes and it's hard to get it back, okay? And even if you start with bigger numbers, you get similar things coming down. By the way, I should mention, if you take the perfectly anti-symmetric model on one island, you get the same thing. No matter how big a number you start with, um, the, the, there's an overall tendency for it to decrease. That model is not stable to, uh, um, to evolution, even within the very perfect anti-symmetric model there. Okay, it's not stable, it tends to go down. We don't have a general understanding of in what cases models will go up, in what cases they'll go down. Okay? That's like understanding, you know, when you take a microscopic model and you ask, does it form a superconductor or an insulator or something else? We have no idea how to do that still in physics. But what we do know is if something happens, then a whole bunch of other things happen as well. And so here, once it sort of starts going up, we have some understanding of whether it'll continue. When the, with the generalist mutations, we have some understanding that once it goes, starts going up, then it'll tend to slow down in a particular way. And we can sort of predict how this, uh, um, um, uh, how this does, uh, um, does that. Um, and so the, we have some um, understanding of that with the phenotype models, I don't have much understanding. The subtle thing, is you have to, these can't be perfectly correlated. These can't be equal to each other. They have to be some different function. So you need sort of sufficient correlations, but not too much. I think if you put in a little bit of extra, 
um, kinds of uh, um, uh, phenotypes coming in as well. So it isn't just as one quantity, it's maybe two quantities, two different proteins say are important, then you can maybe be able to get it more, more easily, okay? So this is now where I'm gonna to appeal to biology. Okay. Everything that we see is conditional upon evolution. And looking back conditional upon evolutionary success over long times, things are gonna look special. They're gonna look at the special things that happened. Okay. So my feeling is if one has a sort of, you know, choice of models or models in different regimes with one of which can give rise to um, continuing, ev continuing evolution, diversification, and the other one can't, then the longer term effects of the, the evolution, which are ones which are often the things that just happen to have happened and made the evolution keep going, is gonna mean that one is gonna end up in sort of a phase where things wander around. Okay. So the concrete thing I would say is in my, the random landscape models with just a single strain, there I believe there's a family of models also, a generic family where you don't have um, uh, continuing evolution with small um, feedback. Okay, small ecological feedback. However, if you had such a system, it's also much less responsive to environmental changes. It's much more, um, be more, more likely to be destroyed by environmental changes. If you have one which tends to wander around, it'll wander around differently in different locations, and it's much more likely to be robust to environmental changes. So my sense is that the long-term evolution will drive these systems in a, in a way that will tend to uh, um, be the ones that uh, um, um, uh, that have these kinds of, uh, these kind of properties. Okay? That does not mean there's evolutionary pressures to do that. What it means is that the ones which happen to be successful for very long times, and by producing lots of um, offspring in the sense of many types of bacteria or many types of insects, that those ones are going to be ones that along the way somehow got these properties. But it doesn't mean there's necessary evolutionary pressures for it to do that. So I was getting more into the philosophical questions. Are there some, some concrete questions on some of the, the sort of analysis or the sort of ways of trying to, trying to do things? Okay, well, I said, if, if you have follow-up questions and a couple of you sent some really good um, follow-up questions um, uh, previously, I'm happy to answer them by... Um, by email and they all may also prompt some things that might come up in the in the discussions um, at, the, at the round table. So. Thank you. Thank you very much for these and preceding lectures. Uh, it's been a long day and uh, thank you everybody who has uh, followed all the lectures today and uh, we'll meet again on next Monday. Okay. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye. Everyone. Nice.